Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience. Um, if you follow the program, this morning's um, presentation from Lon Shirinian has been moved uh, to now. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Dr. Shirinian was unable to uh, travel from Canada to be with us today. So he's asked me that I present very briefly uh, his presentation to you. Uh, Dr. Shirinian is a writer, a filmmaker, and Emeritus Professor of Comparative Literature at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario. He received his PhD in Comparative Literature at the University of Montreal and became a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston. He was the head of the Department of English for a number of years and he retired as a Professor Emeritus in 2010 after 35 years of teaching. So let me adjust the, sorry, the microphone's here. Very well. Now, Lauren is also one of the authors contributing to the book that all the uh, speakers you've been hearing for the past two days are contributing to. Um, and I may not have mentioned it earlier, but the, the book is expected to come out at the end of the year uh, and will be entitled From Catastrophe to Genocide, uh, The Armenian Question, quote unquote, revisited a century later. Um, Lauren's chapter, uh, focuses on uh, the orphans of the Armenian Genocide and the Ottoman uh, leadership's plan towards children in its genocidal plan. Uh, so he has made a very specific reference to a group of orphans who ended up in uh, Canada at the Georgetown farm. And the reason why he's focused on it is that both his parents and his maternal uncle were uh, amongst this group of orphans who ended up in, uh, in, in Canada. Um, so first of all, in his chapter, Dr. Shirinyan uh, deals with uh, genocide as a conceptual, uh, as a concept, and uh, brings it down to the issue of orphans and how uh, destroying uh, children uh, or, or, the, or the offspring of the parents is, uh, is part of the genocidal uh, plan and how it, it is integral, in, integral to, the, to the plans. Um, he uh, compares this to uh, other conflicts of the 20th century, including the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide. And he uses one, uh, ch one telegram by Talat Pasha, which was uh, for the opening of his chapter, which is very telling, where in 1916, uh, Talat Pasha uh, writes that he's heard of certain orphanages which have been opened uh, and we're receiving uh, children of Armenians. And um, he writes here that whether this is done uh, through ignorance of our real purpose or through contempt of it, the government will regard the feeding of such children or any attempt to prolong their lives as an act entirely opposed to its purpose, since it's cons it considers the survival of these children as detrimental. So I think this is very telling of the policy at the time and um, what, what, what uh, Dr. Shirinyan does uh, f from that point on is he describes uh, what, what developments we have seen since then in the 20th uh, century. Of course, you, you will be aware of uh, the uh, 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, there's also a, a very interesting judgment before the International Criminal Court uh, in the case of Lubanga, which deals with the use of child soldiers. So he deals with that uh, in, the concept of, uh, in the context of uh, the plight of children uh, during armed conflicts. And um, going back to the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide, he uh, does a very brief presentation, but very useful on the Near East Relief's efforts uh, in um, helping out the not only the refugees, but also uh, the, the orphans of the genocide. Um, one of the uh, reports of the Near East Relief highlights the terrible conditions and here we say the daunting task of aid workers having to select which of the children's which of the children will be taken care of, and he talks uh, talks about a principle of the survival of the fittest in many villages, where uh, mothers are required to select from their children those who are to be granted the opportunity to live. A very macabre realization, as you can imagine, um, at the time. Uh, the reports of the Near East Relief discusses uh, starvation and misery, and not only in, uh, in Eastern Anatolia, but also in Armenia, uh, or, or what is known today as the Republic of Armenia, which had received 
uh, thousands and thousands of refugees and orphans as well. Um, he shows us here a picture of, uh, of the dining room of one of the uh, um, orphanages uh, which were established by the Near East Relief uh, across uh, Anatolia and in various parts uh, in, in the region. And from that point on, what seems to have happened is that various requests were made by uh, either families or governments to receive these, children's, uh, these children elsewhere. Um, we have a picture here of Jamal Pasha uh, at an orphanage which was held by a woman named Halide Edib. And this orphanage actually had a different purpose, which was, according to the documentation, and in one book also entitled The Lions of Marash, um, the purpose of this orphanage was uh, the Turkification of these children. So, for example, the boys would be circumcised, they were given Arabic or Turkish <coughs> names, and uh, Jamal Pasha was very much aware of the operations of, of, of this orphanage. In the chapter, again, which you'll have an opportunity to read by the end of the year, um, uh, Dr. Shiran also describes the conditions there uh, in the orphanage. So. I'd like to share with you here one uh, excerpt from uh, Dr. Shirinyan's uh, chapter, uh, which is a passage from Andranik Zarukyan's memoir, which describes the emotional scar Armenian orphans lived with all their lives. And here he says, scattered in the four corners of the world is a lost multitude, tens of thousands of lost souls like me who were and always will be the most unfortunate of people because they had no childhood. We seem to have gone through something quite nameless instead a savage mixture of misery and suffering, the very memory of which, even le years later, still hardens the heart and scorches the soul. We were never children because we were Armenian and we were orphans. A very touching excerpt uh, from Zarukhan's uh, book. Um, so uh, he here uh, we move on to Canada, and I'm, and I'm switching very quickly uh, because this is where uh, Shirinyan's parents end up, and he, he discusses in his chapter how the Armenian Relief Fund in Canada were very keen to help Armenian orphans. However, um, the government was not of the same view. Finally, they reluctantly accepted to allow 100 Armenian orphans to Canada with a series of provisions, such as that uh, the fund be responsible for all the children until they reach a certain age, that they uh, only allow those who are healthy, uh, that the province provides some education, and each child to be placed in adoption services, et cetera. So there are a number of conditions. This is just a, a small uh, uh, excerpt of the provisions. So Canada had very strict rules. Uh, those of you will remember that at the time, Canada did not even uh, recognize the Nansen passport, which was delivered and, and issued to those who were stateless. So Canada had very strict rules at the time. So here uh, we, we see a few pictures of the um, uh, boys leaving uh, Istanbul in 1922. Uh, they were taken from one uh, uh, refugee camp to another, uh, they end up also in um, in Corfu, and here they take uh, a, a, a boat from Corfu, and uh, they do end up in Canada. I'm, I'm skipping really stages to uh, get through. Uh, this is the, 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 the Georgetown farm, uh, as it was in 1973, but this is the location where these uh, children were uh, raised and uh, given assistance to in, in Canada. Uh, here's some images of them working. They've, they're now in Canada at the Georgetown farm. And this is uh, the Dr. Shirinyan's father, Mampre Shirinyan, at the Georgetown farm in 1925, 1926. And these are the boys here. We, ha we have a number of them. Um, so this is, uh, so there are a number of incidents while they were uh, at the Georgetown farm in the 1920s. One of them was that the uh, direction thought that they should change their names, which were according to them, unpronounceable. There was some res resistance from the Armenian orphans, one of whom who said, Mr. Pierce, see that boy sitting in the corner. His name is Mestro Pagopian. They gave him name Jackson. What he know of Mr. Jackson? When he young baby, Armenian priest put water on his head and named him Hagopian after his father and mother. Then he lost his father, his mother, and also his country. And all, all that he has left with is Hagopian. And now you want to take that away too. Very uh, touching, uh, I believe. Um, now, what happened is other incidents, such as uh, the families where the boys were, were placed, um, uh, some families did not honor the contracts, and they're not providing education, for example. Um, and on the side of the orphans, also, there's a certain fear of assimilation and losing their Armenian heritage. 
Finally, uh, the superintendent of the boys, Mr. Alex Sanyan, who's a teacher, founded a monthly journal called Ararat, uh, a publication which was written and produced by the boys. And uh, here's a, an image of, uh, of that. Uh, Lauren found uh, uh, copies of it in, in films uh, in the, uh, I believe it's the National Library in Canada. And um, there's uh, several uh, issues of it were available there. Uh, he wanted me to finish with this uh, short um, uh, yeah, piece or poem written by Khachi Karajan in the Ararat um, uh, Monthly. I am an Armenian boy. Four months ago, I went out from the Armenian boy's farm home to a new place at Mr. Earl Hindley's place in Eramosa Township. It is a great happiness to me in that I am learning how to farm. Mr. Hindley is a good gentleman, and Mrs. Hindley is a very nice lady. They have a little boy, Bruce, about three years of age. I love him as I would love my little brother. They are, they are very good to me. I'm going to tell you about my new farm. I get up every morning at half past five, do the chores, milk the cows, feed the cattle, and clean the stable. Then I get my breakfast. I must get ready for school. I start out from the farm at half past eight, walk half an hour to be at the school at nine o'clock. I have my lunch with me. We are two Armenian boys in our school, and all of the others are Canadian boys and girls. I like them. They are great playmates, and I think they like me too. At 4 o'clock, <laughs> school is over. I must be at home soon to, be, to feed the chicken. I take great care of them, so they lay good. I have to do the same chores as I did in the morning. I like my work well. At 8 o'clock, I must be ready to study my lessons. I will try to progress as well as uh, any Canadian boy can. I have come from Corfu to Canada 15 months ago. Uh, this is very gripping of a long day for a small child who's been uprooted uh, from a very, very distant place. And uh, Lorne has also asked me to play this video, and I will end this with this. It's about five minutes about the story of his parents, I believe. how your grandfather understood his life in the diaspora as an orphan survivor of the Armenian genocide. He was born Mampre Tertibian in the village of Geve, southeast of Constantinople in 1910. Although I had asked my father many times to tell me what he lived through in 1915, he always refused until very late in his life. Even then he was very guarded, as he knew full well he would relive the painful memories he had suppressed all these years. He had very few memories of his family and their life together before the Turkish soldiers came to the village in 1915 to deport them forever. The Armenian genocide had begun. The day before their arrival, my grandmother had gone to Constantinople to visit an aunt and narrowly missed being deported with her family. She had no choice but to stay alone in the capital during the genocide, wondering what had become of her family. My father and his family were forced south towards Konya in the deportation column that grew daily as other Armenians joined the death march. In a very short time, my father said, all his family members were killed. For four years from the age of six, he wandered alone, hiding and doing what he could to stay alive. At the end of the war and the genocide, he, his mother, and one of his sisters were the only ones to survive in his extended family. In 1919, after facing the horrors of the genocide alone, my father was found by nearest relief and placed in the Chankalkoy orphanage near Istanbul. His mother never stopped looking for her family and finally found her son through the relief agencies. She would visit him every Saturday and take him to a park. In 1920, my grandmother remarried and from then on took the name Takui Shilinyan. My father adopted his mother and became Mampere Shirinyan. Their Tertibian family disappeared. One Saturday morning in the autumn of 1920, during their regular visit to the park, my grandmother told my father that she had to leave because of the war for Turkish independence. I have to leave you, my son, she told him. 
You'll be better off with the aid groups here. You'll have a better chance at a future than anything I could offer you. And she left to seek refuge in Varna, Bulgaria. My father never saw his mother again. Because of the impending war, the Lord Mayor's Fund of London, England, moved the Armenian orphans to the safety of Greece. My father was sent to an orphanage in Corfu. Two years later, he was selected to be one of the 100 Armenian orphans to come to a farm home in Georgetown, Ontario, to become farmers and Canadian citizens. My father arrived on September 1st, 1924. In the Georgetown Orphanage, my father received word that relief agencies had found his only remaining sister in an orphanage in the Middle East. Against hope, here was the unbelievable chance to find a member of his family alive. In my father's file in the Georgetown archives, there is a series of letters my father had written to the administrators, begging them to bring his sister to be with him in Canada. In the final letter, my father learned that his sister had died in the camp. The government was unable or unwilling to act fast enough to save her. Now my father was truly alone in a strange new country. He and his mother kept in touch over the years through letters. He learned that he had two stepsisters, but he grew up alone in Canada. My father sobbed as he told me a story that day long ago. After all these years, having his own family and running a successful business, the absence of his mother had always remained a profound wound and source of great sadness. Unfortunately, there was much more that wasn't said between us and never will be said, for he died in 1988. I learned when he opened up to me that he lived privately with the terrible memories of the genocide all these years, and that when one is an orphan, one is an orphan for life. In great part, this is what it meant to be a survivor of the Armenian genocide in the diaspora. <laughs>